of some of the world's most disruptive tech field startups, uh, scale-ups. She's seen as the most trusted talent advisor in the UK and is really immersed in the startup and uh, scale-up ecosystem. And that's something we'll be hopefully discussing later on this morning. So she founded JD & Co in 2011, like all good entrepreneurs from her bedroom, <laughs> um, and is now one of the leading headhunting and people advisory firms in Europe. And what she's doing is helping to build up the boards of really successful startups across the continent. Um, really important this, I think um, what Jo understands, she's a female founder and she understands firsthand how much more difficult it's been for female-led business to attract investment and achieve growth. And again, we'll talk a little bit more about that. And I know that's why you got involved in mentoring and you're now an active investor in yourself and part of the Alma Angels Network. So Jo um, is very keen to give back to the next generation and she's become a supporter and judge for the Great British Entrepreneur, uh, Entrepreneur Awards and is about to rejoin the judging panel for the sixth year in a row. So Jo, um, I was going to say enough about you, but now more about you. So <laughs> very much welcome. Um, can you tell us a bit more uh, to start with? Can you tell us a bit about yourself and this entrepreneurial journey you've had over the last 11 years? Thank you. Well, well, firstly, thanks ever so much for inviting me. I love supporting the startup ecosystem and I hope I can share some helpful tips and advice today. Um, so my entrepreneurial journey, gosh, um, I still pinch myself when I think I'm an entrepreneur. Um, I grew up in a working class family uh, in the Midlands, um, uh, we all were told that, you know, you leave school at 16, you get an apprenticeship. And if you're really lucky, you get to work for a big company and uh, you get a pension and stay there till you retire. Um, and I think I, I started my entrepreneurial journey actually just out of pure frustration. Um, I was working in the corporate world um, for a big global search firm. We had offices all over the world, but I didn't actually enjoy working in a corporate I didn't like the working practices um, I didn't like the way that they treated clients so I thought I'm just going to create the company that I would want to work for and that that was the motivation so yeah as you said I like all good entrepreneurs um, set up from my bedroom with no real plan no real aspirations to dominate I'm, I'm afraid it was just I want to do three things I want to work with great clients I want to work with really brilliant colleagues and I work, want to work on projects that I'm really interested in and I'm that I'm passionate about and get me out of bed in the morning and 10 years on uh, we're seen as the leading headhunting firm now in Europe um, and we crunched some data recently I think we're up to 500 leaders and uh, board members of the fastest growing um, startups and scale-ups in Europe um, which is something I'm really proud of um, and then my other hat as you mentioned um, again was just out of pure frustration I started mentoring uh, female founders because um, I didn't get that mentorship myself and I started investing in female founders because I think you all know the stats um, female founders get one p in every pound that is invested into uh, companies in the UK. So I thought, gosh, at this rate, I think we're gonna get to 10p in the pound by 2045. So I thought I'd better put my money where my mouth is. And so um, I've invested in 10 uh, amazing startups around subjects that I'm passionate about about mental health, wellness, sustainability. Um, and my biggest investment and the first one, I sit on the board, uh, we're an all female leadership team. We've grown 62% year on year, bootstrapped to profitability. Um, and that's a business called Sign of the Times, which is a pre-loved designer resale platform. So we uh, curate secondhand clothes because the world has enough stuff. And so we try to keep the things we've already got in circulation. Sorry, that was a that was a mouthful, wasn't it? I did breathe. 
<laughs> that's fantastic. <laughs> so, so um, what do you think have been the key factors in your success of the businesses that you've set up to date? Um, I think a little, I think if I knew what it was going to take to get to where I've got to, I never would have done it. I never would have started. So I think a bit of ignorance early on really helped. Um, and I think just utter belief that I wanted to improve the status quo, um, and really help people. Um, that's something that really drives me, S fixing things, solving problems, um, and disrupting the things that have always been that way. I think that's why I probably wasn't very good in the corporate world, because I was always trying to sidestep things and break things and trying to cut through the red tape. Yeah. And what, what have been the biggest challenges you faced over the last uh, 11 years? Um, I think I think you mentioned about being a female founder. Things are certainly a lot better, but it is it's really it is really tough. Um, it, you know, I I joked recently on a panel. Actually, a few people tweeted about it because um, uh, ninety percent of all the inbound emails and post I receive sales post to the office is always dress, addressed to Mr. Joe Dalton. And so um, I, I say it's my advantage, just have uh, uh, a gender neutral name because uh, it helps, but it's, it's tough. Um, I think not taking um, funding and bootstrapping um, and trying to do everything differently. I think sometimes I look back and I think, why didn't I just set up a headhunting business like everybody else? Why didn't I do it the same way with commission and a big sales team? But I didn't want to do that. Um, I don't believe it's the right thing for clients. So I did it differently, but um, probably made life a lot harder for myself. So, so tell us about that. that. That's fascinating. You said you you did it differently because obviously successful businesses do tend to break away from the herd and do things very differently. So how, how did that realization come about that you needed to set up a, a, a I don't like the word headhunting, I think a talent, talent <laughs> acquisition company, as we're going to talk about later in, in terms of what you did. Why did you break away? Why did you what made you realize that you could do it better and differently? I, I think I think fundamentally the recruitment industry is is broken. Um, it's sales driven and it's commission led. So you the bar to entry is really low. You know, estate agents, <laughs> recruiters, they're all in that that same bucket. And you have a low base salary and then you have an OTE. That means that if I hire you into the role, I get money, but if somebody else goes into the role, the other consultant gets the money. But what about being the right person for the job and what's the best for the client? So I just thought I'm going to set up my business with no sales function. So my my plan was if we do a really good job with the first client, we we lucky luckily I had my first client. And we knock it out of the park, we over deliver, then they're going to recommend us to the next client. Ten years on, 100 percent of the work that we've delivered has been through recommendation and referral. It holds our feet to the fire. We have to deliver because if we don't deliver, we won't get recommended to the next project. And all of the partners at JD and Co uh, are not on commission. So they're on um, a great salary, which means that it doesn't matter if person A or person B gets the CEO role, your, your salary is, is guaranteed and you, you collaborate with everybody else in the business. Okay. And, um, and, and I'm, I'm fascinated to, 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 to see how some of these changes that have happened post-COVID, we mentioned it briefly when we, when we had this chat before the, uh, the seminar, but um, have you seen things, you know, like the great resignation? Um, and for those who don't know, the great resignation is people just leaving their jobs and just leaving to do nothing. And in the States, 
we're talking about 50, 60 million people have left the workforce over the last two years and have not gone into another job. And do you think that's affecting a lot of organisations at the moment? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think there's the there's the great resignation and there's the great reset now that's mm. happening. And um, employers are uh, realising that those heady statements that they were making um, about work from everywhere, work from the beach, um, those are all great in theory, but yeah. even down to the practicality of how can you employ that person without an entity in that country? And if you are an engineer, um, where is the data? How is your data being stored? You know, you know, there are so many challenges. And I think there is um, a lot of loneliness around um everybody talks about quiet quitting when people are just showing up um and i think in the sort of 50 plus age bracket in particular people are leaving the workforce um uh, leaving their jobs and leaving the workforce completely um yeah. just just not entering back in so rather than being in a situation where um the the recession is coming and well, let's be frank and real we're totally in the recession already um yes. the there is um going to be a lot more talent around there actually isn't but you've also got this strange market where for the first time ever companies are hiring and making redundancies at the same time because it's a it's a it's a reset of skill sets as well as um, people resigning. Yeah, that's fascinating because um, the World Economic Forum they do their they do a skills report every year, and every year over the last three or four years they've been saying that one in three of the jobs uh, today yeah. will basically need different skills yeah. within the next decade, and so yeah. therefore it's not a matter of just attracting the right talent, but also developing the talent in your company. Have you come across this phenomenon at all? Yeah, ab absolutely. There is um, there is more need than ever for uh, training and development within businesses. And also um, lots of companies in growth mode, you know, in those bullish markets were hiring for potential in this sort of market, in a bear market, you need to hire for skills that you need in the business today. You need them to join in a month's time and be effective within the first 60, 90 days. And that's a different landscape um, that that's changed. And so there isn't the opportunity to grow new skill sets there isn't the opportunity to evolve because the demand for revenue, funding mm. runway, it's putting extra pressure on companies right now. And again, that's a really important point you've just made because, as you say, we all know we're already in a recession, regardless of you know what the economic statistics tell us, which are always six months behind anyway and need to be revised. Yeah. So if we're in that position, what you're telling us is that the hiring um, strategies of businesses have literally changed in the last six months. Yes. Yeah. Ab absolutely. Um, look, I, you know, I'm an I'm an eternal optimist. I, I I look at recessions as a great time of innovation, and mm. especially for my sector. You know, in the last few recessions, we've created Uber, Airbnb, Netflix. You know, they all they all started in recession. So I think there is we can dial up at this exact moment innovation and creativity um but talent is still in high demand and mm. short supply and no, yeah. yeah i mean you're absolutely right there was a recent survey of uh, of global ceos about 1200 of the biggest uh, ceos of the biggest companies and yet again you know as every year the the number one concern they had was the um, retention and acquisition of talent so if yeah. that's what they're saying, it's interesting to it'll be interesting to see how their hiring strategies 
will change over the next six to 12 months. The, the, the one good thing about what they were saying was we talked about in recession, they all believed, and this is globally now, that we were going into a recession, but we'd be come out very quickly. So this would be over in six to nine months, which again means, according to what you've said, that strategy will change yet again when it comes to hiring yeah. people um, in 2023. Yeah. But I think that's, you know, in terms of the key word there is change. And I think in terms of skill sets, being able to work with large amounts of ambiguity, be able to make decisions when you only ever have 50% of the information in front of you. Um, turning, you know, turning on a sixpence, pivoting, all of those are, are the most uh, in-demand skills. So talking about attracting talent um, and retaining it, one of the most important things for any entrepreneur, and we saw this last week when we were talking, when we had the uh, all the fastest growing companies in Wales together in one room, and you know when they accepted an award, they all say, it's not about me as the entrepreneur, it's about the team around me. And I know you've built up an incredible team of people and are passionate about how other businesses can do that. So tell us about, you know, how important it is to have this amazing team and what are the key elements that that, that make up a really successful team within an organization oh yeah um well i totally concur with all of those founders i would not be anywhere in my entrepreneurial journey if it wasn't for having an amazing team around me. Um, the JDers inspire me to do better every single day. Um, I think in terms of building awesome teams, um, the two words that spring to mind immediately are diversity and awareness. Um, and I know we'll probably talk about DI in a lot more detail further along yeah. but diversity generally just having different types of people diversity of thought introverts extroverts people that are reflectors people that can make instant decisions left brain right brain you've you've got to have lots of different types of thinkers in a business and you've got to have diversity of skill set as well um you've got to be able to have that sort of swiss army knife you know today we're talking about the startup community and further on in your journey founders will start thinking about specialists subject matter experts but in the early days it's those generalists it's the wearers of many hats um, and then awareness I think is super important for building um, amazing teams I think the founders need to be aware they need a lot of personal awareness they need to know what are their talent spikes and what are the what are their blind spots what are the things that they um doesn't give them any energy or they're not so good at um because as you start building a, an amazing team you need to carry that on through the rest of the company so we should all know as a team when it comes to taking a penalty who's the person that we don't even have to speak to each other we just know you know <laughs> yep and 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 up they go and um they're taking the penalty and then I think the third thing if I was going to be pushed on the third thing would be bravery I think it's I think in the startup world especially at this moment I think you need really brave teams who are going to make brave decisions give really brave feedback to each other and feel really safe um with their colleagues and don't you think that's what's really important here? I am fascinated when you, and we'll talk about the, the, the standard definition of, uh, of diversity and inclusion, but it was fascinating what you said was that when you said diverse, it was the way people were and their characteristics and their personalities and how you bring all that together. Because there's always a temptation, I think, particularly for weak leaders, to actually appoint people who are essentially mirrors of themselves. And um, as a result, you create this um, vanilla team that, um, that is in a position where it just cannot, because of the characteristics of that team, take, um, take that business anywhere. Yeah, 
yeah i i totally agree i i think the i think diversity and inclusion if we you know we hone in on this now um diversity equals profitability it's as it's as simple as that you know look at the statistics gender diverse teams 21 percent ebitda over all male teams um the stats for ethnically diverse teams is incredible but i agree with you i think one of the worrying things in an interview process is when somebody says they will fit in really well and normally that's because they've shared an anecdote about a rugby team they both like or a type of music they love and I think you can perhaps put too much weight on those shared uh school experiences you know oh we all went to Eton um let's not get political but that might have something <laughs> to do with um you know uh, everybody yes. thinking the same um but it's it's think it's people that are thinking differently you need to um be able to uh solve problems and you need lots of different schools of thought for that good and um when we talk about the teams um what about the perfect employee is there a perfect employee? <laughs> I think there's a perfect employee experience. And I think that there is um, there is perfect leaders that create amazing teams. Yeah. So I think it is the way that they're all set up. But I think if I um, if I think about my team, um, I think they all I ask them every week what is do they know that what they're doing is having a direct impact on moving the business forward today and I think if you've got a clear vision and I think if everybody knows what is expected of them but in this really fast changing world um, and especially at the moment um, the other question I always ask everybody is has the mission changed so almost, you know, you can't let somebody in your team um, just be cracking on with a project. Um, and, you know, the, the brief the brief could have changed overnight, constantly yeah. making sure that you're going in the right direction. Good. We've got some questions coming through already. So anybody yeah. else got questions? We, we'll answer them at the end. Um, but um, but yeah, moving on from that um, again, in this CEO survey that that I that um that was published recently. The other thing that, that came through very strongly was how the expectations of employees had changed in that it used to always be the employer in the driving seat. Yeah. So now it's about how, if you want to get the best people, you have to be more transparent, more authentic in, yeah. in what you do as an employer. Have you got examples of that in your dealings with scale of companies across Europe? Yeah, I'm really pleased to say that companies are being a lot more transparent. Things are changing, but there is an ownership and an expectation on that that both sides need to uh, be transparent. You know, the early stages of an interview, it's a bit peacocking and you've got both sides pitching to each other. Um, but you do have to have a moment where you go, what's the realities of the job that you're coming into and for um, the, you know, on both sides and what are the expectations of me once I'm there? Um, I think it's really important when you get to the end of a process that you have, um, you meet up informally at the end um, and you just almost get the candidate to play back to you what, what so what do you really think this this job's going to be all about and what are you going to be doing that's different to where you are at the moment and almost sign up to that um my pet peeve is do not use the probation period as an extended interview you know make the decision that you trust this person and it's a hell yes because if it's not a hell yes let's hire them it's a no do not Absolutely. use the probation period as this sort of dancing around 
moment where you're still not quite sure um, and then set them up for success. The amount of time we hear from people who, well, I, I joined and uh, they said to me that I was going to be doing this, but the reality once I was there was completely different or um, I was told I'd be doing this, but actually I'm doing that. You know, that's 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 the responsibility of both sides. But employers have got to set their um, employees up for success. The onboarding, you know, the first three months are essential. And, and I think the word that I'm coming to here is trust because what you've said there is an interesting um, situation where somebody joins a company they have their expectations they've trusted the employer that they've just taken they've left another job to get there yeah. when they arrive the situation is completely different and yeah. that trust is then eroded from day one yeah. and that has an effect on the relationship yeah, you've got you've got to trust your teams um, and you've got to trust your employer. Um, and there is lots of trust that's that's been broken. Um, and I, there are some terrible, you know, s- terrible stories in in the market. I would just say to any of the founders of startups that are watching today, um, just be just be really honest and, and open about the reality of uh, the opportunity ahead, the uh, funding runway, the some of the challenges that you've got. Uh, people really appreciate that. And, and again, just picking up on that issue about particularly startups, because it's a very different situation when companies have grown and they have hierarchies and structures in place. But how important is it for the founder to be constantly communicating with the staff when they're in this sort of position where there is constant change in the workplace and in the environment in which they're operating? I I think it's absolutely essential. Um, And it was one of the great learnings for me as an entrepreneur early on in my um, founder journey, I realized that I was steaming ahead. I had a plan, um, but I looked around and there's all these casualties behind me because I can work with large amounts of ambiguity. So I'm like, right, okay, we're going roughly north and you're 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 halfway there and meanwhile some of your team might be the type of people and their um psychometric profile or their you know their their personality says right i need all of the information i need to know exactly where i'm going before i take one step forward so I had to change my working style. I had to over communicate. And with remote teams and with people in different time zones, I find that I, if I've got something important to share, I write it down and I share it on Slack. I can't bring myself because I'm too much of a rebel to do internal email. I just, I'm not an, I'm not an email all gal, but um, uh, an update on Slack constantly, what I'm up to, where I am, what clients we're talking to, um, just a really transparent way of communicating. It's important. No, you're right. And, and particularly at a very early stage, it's even though you're the founder, it's critical that everybody else in the organization knows what's going on. Yeah. So they know what you know, essentially. And I, thank God for Slack, as they say, because I couldn't <laughs> imagine trying to do that on email every you all all your day would be taken up just doing that, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, I think I think you've got to um you've you've got to let everybody know. And actually, for all the, the founders watching this today, it really helps, you know, that whole, it sounds so cheesy, but, you know, a problem shared. Um, sometimes you take, you hold all of that responsibility inside and actually just sharing it with the team and um, it, it, it means everybody's focused on trying to collectively fix it. And as a founder, do you have regular team meetings or do you tend to do it online or is it very much ad hoc? How do you manage your team within the business? 
I think cadence of meetings is absolutely crucial to set you up for success. Every Monday morning, we 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 have uh, a standing huddle where everybody talks about what everybody else is doing for the week, um, and then we crack on. Um, but it's it's amazing how you can work right next to somebody, or you can be working on a project, but you can see there are eureka moments in the meeting where it's like, oh God, I didn't didn't realize you were doing that actually I can help you with that or so it is it is really important and then we obviously have monthly get-togethers and where we just make sure that we get together and don't talk about work because I think that's <laughs> as important as talking about work every week yeah going back to to you mentioned diversity and inclusion and I and I think it's becoming increasingly obvious not only because it's the right thing to do, but also it's the right thing to do for the business if it's going to be profitable and successful. Yeah. And it's now becoming the number one priority. Yeah. So um, what advice do you have on how founders can ensure their recruitment process from the job itself, the advert itself, to onboarding is accessible and safe for everyone? Yeah, it's... it's it's such an important uh, point. As I said, for me, it's an absolute no brainer. Diversity equals profitability. And it's as simple as that. Um, gender diverse teams create more EBITDA um, in, and ethnically diverse intersectionality. There is so many, um, so many things that we need to be focused on now. One thing I would say for startup founders is and in the context of this conversation is don't put too much pressure on yourself to have this amazingly slick almost something you'd expect from a big corporate in terms of a recruitment process sometimes um I'm mental founders who present to me sort of a 10 page document setting out their thesis for hiring and they've got this big complex process I would say keep it simple don't try and solve the whole of the DEI agenda um, you know you're, you're, you're one startup with um, lots of pressure on you to make money get to minimum viable product etc but I would say make sure that you are looking in lots of different channels. It's so hard because if you think about it, um, lots of first time founders, you first, you pull in your friends, don't you? And your family members, um, you pull in all the favors you can. You've even got the, you know, the dog doing a bit of admin for you on the side. And then you suddenly realize you're about to make the first hire that's not a family uh, member or friend and that's really scary um, the mistake that you might make is to hire people from your your old life you know the the corporate world you're in before you started or people that know you before you were a founder um, I think it's about making sure that everybody that you bring into the process you give a really fair uh interview with you try not to look for uh hobbies and similar interests um but look for the, some of the skill sets that i talked about earlier especially around handling amb ambiguity and being able to uh work in a constantly changing landscape and i'm sorry that i haven't haven't answered the specifics but i'm one of those people that I'm totally passionate about the DEI agenda. I spoke on a panel about it a couple of weeks ago, but I don't want to put too much pressure on startup founders to solve it all on their own. I think that um, if you, I, the good thing is most of the new startups that I'm looking at have nailed this already. Look at the Startup uh, Awards National Series. Yeah. It was, um, it was just absolutely joyous to see um, such a, a wide range and inclusive um, set of, uh, of finalists it really inspired me yeah and, and as, as you mentioned it's it's when you are the founder you rely on everybody else around you 
making that first hire is probably the most difficult thing you'll do in the first two to three years, isn't it? Yeah. And don't again, don't put too much pressure on yourself. It's this is where I'm going to sound a bit harsh, but startup talent has a sell by date. And so I wouldn't fixate too much on hiring the perfect employee. There are going to be some people that are great for your business for the next 18 months, um, and they're going to evolve and grow as the business grows. And you hope, and and I do quite genuinely, that the people that are working with me now um, are going to, you know, buy me out and run the business in the future. And hopefully, if I'm good, uh, they'll keep me as chairwoman you know that's always the the aspiration but lots of people just are good for different moments in your journey so again don't try and solve one person that's your swiss army knife you're probably going to have a couple of attempts but i would go for skill sets that you need in the business right now do not harm the potential because you need people that can add value really quickly and I, and I said then, it's the most difficult decision you, you make at the beginning of your journey. And I remember um, back in the day when you'd have to use a massive video camera to do videos. So about going back about 17 years, I interviewed a whole range of founders of scale-up companies, about 20 of them. The last question I asked, I said, what's the most difficult thing you've had to do on your journey? And, you know, every single one of them said it was having to let go of somebody in my, who was in my founding team that just couldn't grow with a company. And they said, it's heartbreaking because these people, had, I'd hired them, they were my first hires, they'd come in. And I realized, you know, two, three years in, that doesn't matter what I did, they weren't the right person to come with me. Have you come across examples like that? Yeah, all, all the time. Um, sometimes it sounds, I, I shock founding teams because when we'll have maybe an offsite and I'll say that to the to the the CEO or the the um founder that's leading the business that somebody in their founding team will not be with them within a year and Mm. you can see her or him like go what absolutely no way you know that's never going to happen um but yeah it 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 does happen a lot when I set up my first business uh we took um before jd and co um my advice is always do lots of due diligence and uh research uh the business partners that you set up with because i didn't naively and one of them came across and he was brilliant in big companies and you know top performer um put him in a little serviced office when there were four of us um, and we hadn't even got laptops and three months into the to the uh, role you realize that he just couldn't operate without all the infrastructure of um, a big company Um, and you know he's safely back in the corporate world now and has been ever since Um, but yeah it was it was a good lesson to learn especially before I set up JD and Co which um, yeah I ended up founding on my own good and, and and again on that issue i remember talking to a very successful uh, scale up company in west wales um a family owned business the two brothers and the two wives were running the business and it got to a stage where they felt they had to bring in uh, somebody from the corporate world and they brought that person in didn't fit into the culture at all they lasted six months and had to leave and is that a big challenge of when you bring people into a particular culture, how do you get them to assimilate properly? Or in some cases, probably it was just the wrong decision to hire them. Yeah, um, founders make that mistake all of the time. I think they get fixated with brand badges. Um, mm. and I think a lot of that is driven by the funders of those businesses. I think they're more reassured if you've got x amazon x facebook x google sort of banded about on investment decks and so they 
over index the importance of that experience and time and time again, especially in in revenue generating roles. If you're ex Google, ex Facebook, and you are going to um, lead on revenue in a brand new startup with no brand, no reputation, no track record, um, somebody who had the weight of a big logo behind them, um, are they really a great salesperson or a marketeer? Or actually, are they just riding on uh, the reputation of, you know, these these big giants? Um, and I think it's very rare to find somebody who can slide into a startup straight from a big corporate I think you need to be really careful on the interview process and ask them how they think their role will change and make sure again it goes back to awareness have they got the personal awareness to understand that this is completely different and they're going to have to adapt so on 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 that issue we you you mentioned obviously the, the challenges that female founders have. I'm assuming that the company also appoint, uh, um, does executive searches for board members. Yes, yeah. So so here's here's an interesting situation, obviously, because I've seen this time and time again where female founded businesses, the funder usually insists on putting somebody on the board, and they put somebody who is male, pale and stale and yep. have no idea of how that business works but they've been put on because of their track record stroke experience in a corporate setting that seems to be a recipe for a disaster and it usually is so how do you overcome that i think i think things are changing um and i'm a really big advocate of modern boards i think having somebody on a board that's an honorary member that's just an, a name. Thankfully, um, those days are numbered. And in startups, it, it, it stereotypically tends to be somebody's dad who put the money in in the first place, is retired. And, and there have absolutely no disrespect to all dads out there, but of no use whatsoever, you know, in an AI or a gaming or, you know, wh- whatever this new business is. Um, I think you as founders need to mitigate against that. I think you need to understand what are what are the things that you are trying to unlock over the next two years? Is it a, is it a dragon type that you need? Is it somebody to unlock a key relationship? Is it somebody with experience of international markets? And hold the investors to account that if they're going to put one of their people on the board, um, that they need to justify why they're going to be so good. But yes, um, pale melon stale typically is, <laughs> is not the right answer, but let's see. So we've got a few questions. So I'm gonna to go to the, the question and answer. So the, the first question is about the fear of failure. And there's a lot of talk about that. And it's one of the questions we keep asking when we do our big surveys of entrepreneurs in the UK, would a fear of failure hold you back? And believe it or not, there's still about 45% of potential entrepreneurs who say the fear of failure would hold them back. So um, have you been vulnerable in that, you know, and and, and shown your teams, the teams you, the team you work with now, you know, that it is okay to fail? And how do you build trust from that? Because obviously failure to many of us is a learning experience. Yeah, I think you learn fairly early on in your career to put your hands up when you make a mistake. I I learned that in the corporate world before I even became uh, an entrepreneur. Um, I would just say, fail fast um, and and learn from it because I, I was a bit concerned over the last few years that failures almost became uh, things that you dined out on and lots of founders sort of writing these long, uh, I failed and I've lost everybody's money and um, almost sort of praised for um, celebrating failure. 
And I do think that it can have an absolutely catastrophic effect on all of the people involved. Um, and so I, I definitely make mistakes every single day. Um, but I, I've always learned to make quick decisions. So make a decision, do, you know, or make a decision not to make a decision, but keep moving forward. And if you fail with that decision that you've made, make sure you can make the next decision to get yourself and your team out of that failing moment and into the next moment as quickly as possible would be my advice. But gosh, if you are worried about failure, um, the startup world is not for you. It's uh, <laughs> wrought with danger and full of potholes. In fact, actually, I was going to say the thing that I always the reason I love mentoring uh, startup founders is because I see the startup world almost like a this row of potholes. That, and I've fallen down every single one multiple times. And so I love mentoring and investing in first time founders, because I just think if I can just just ease you around a couple of those potholes, you're still going to fall in four or five of them. I feel like I've done a good job and that I've helped somebody on their journey. <laughs> And we we discussed earlier on about the issues about um, about accessing and uh, attracting talent. And one of the questions here is about um, making the mistake of hiring quickly due to availability around the suitability. So you know, what's the advice there when the potentially the right talent is not available, but you need to fill the job? Yeah, it's a great question. I always my mantra is hire slow and fire fast and if it's not a hell yes if you are not completely excited um, about getting this person in your business don't do it so you've then got an immediate gap my advice is short sharp shot of expertise get somebody in for three months nine times out of ten in the early days um you're you're saying well i want somebody we want our first head of people we yeah. want them to do the strategy we want them to hire all of the people we want them to coach the leadership team we want them to do payroll we want them to do admin we want them to produce contracts like that's so many different people. And so maybe you need somebody really quickly right now for a few weeks to set the strategy and then actually play down the role and just have somebody as a people manager for the next six months and then hire again. In terms of developing effective leadership skills and stronger, more productive teams is one of the questions now. How do you do that? How, how? What's the best way of doing that? Is it by experience? Is it through learning? Is it through formal channels such as, you know, executive courses? How do you do that? There, I I would say it's definitely a mixture of of all of those. Um, I think mentoring is really key. In fact, at JD and Co, we spend a lot of time, um, and this links on to the DEI question as well. Um, we had a, an example recently where an amazing uh, female VP of engineering, she was awesome, but the company needed a CTO and she just wasn't quite there. She was about a, a year, 18 months away. So what we did is we hired a board member who was an experienced CTO just to coach and mentor her for the first six months to get her up that career ladder as quickly as possible. Um, and I think mentoring, um, so making sure in your business, if you've got a, a young, quite inexperienced head of marketing, introduce them to the best CMO that you know of. And if you don't know them, you know, ask a business like ours to introduce you, um, mentor them. I think formal courses are great, but um, I would say for the startup world, I've had mixed reviews. They're all a bit too formulaic and theoretical. Um, yeah. And there's nothing better than practical 
ad advice. Um, and I think we we do things like we'll read a book of the month and share all the learnings and we'll have lunch and learns where somebody has um, an experience that some of the newer members of the team want to gain. And so we'll just organize it. Everybody will sit and listen to somebody who's the expert in that area. Excellent. We've got a question about um, maybe the you probably charge for this normally, so uh, so I'm not sure it's asking the question. But uh, what's the perfect job description for a sales role? Oh gosh, um, my nemesis, the area that I, I I dislike most. Can it can it can the headline be somebody that doesn't act like a salesperson? Um, <laughs> I I think I think the perfect job spec is one that is specific. Think about when you're hiring for anybody in the business, whether it's a sales leader or not, it isn't central casting. This is a role for you at your unique moment in time. So don't think about stereotypes of what is a great sales leader. Say if you're involved in the future of work and you're actually selling something to the HR directors and the people directors of businesses. And you actually need somebody with a deep subject matter expertise in your area and somebody that is just really passionate about that subject. Um, and I think you'll have lot, a lot more success than trying to hire stereotypes or, God forbid, stealing um, a job spec online from some big corporate that's full of words. You know, if you cut and paste job specs, people um, stylize them to your small startup. There's nothing worse. I see it. And I think you've just cut and paste that. You don't know what half of those words in the must have section even mean. So, yeah, yeah sorry, I haven't answered that question. But if that person wants to DM me, I can share a few, but promise not to cut and paste them verbatim. Thank you. Um, and in terms of when you're trying to find the right person, what's most important, personality or skill set? And how do you find <laughs> that balance between the two? I think it's got to be attitude in a startup yeah. every day of the week and twice on Sunday. It's it's their it's their ability to uh, be resilient. Um, it's a mixture of hard skills and soft skills. Of course, in a startup, if somebody isn't bringing hard skills to the table and you need to build a mobile app and you haven't got any mobile engineers, then of course you need those hard skills or if you need to really create a brand or you need to create a physical product, you need experience, but I would I would take a great attitude over um, an a hole every day of the week. And of course, the, it's it's normally taken, isn't it, that whatever technical skills anybody has, you you take that's that's the that's the bot that's the foundation. It's what you add on top of that that's important, is it not? Yeah, and and again, it's it's not culture fit. It's culture add. What are they going to add to the culture of the business? And what are they going to add to the team dynamic? How does their, uh, their them being hired into the team, the acquisition of that talent, grow the capability of the talent within that team? Good. And and we've talked about the, the, the changes in, in terms of... Um what's happened after COVID and now we obviously young people looking at at potential careers look at it very differently to to generations come before them so do you think recruitment practice need to change to attract younger talents to businesses yeah I certainly I certainly think there's a huge disconnect at the moment with what um, a Gen Z is expecting day-to-day from their employer and uh, what employers uh, need in terms of skill set and attitude in, in their businesses right now. And so I think both sides need to do a little bit of work, um, but employers need to look more broadly. They need to be in advertising and attracting uh, talent across multiple channels. Um, young people really expect as a given a really diverse and inclusive workplace. Um, but 
I think they also need to understand the realities that, especially in this economic climate, the um, startups are a great, uh, great way to supercharge your career. Two years in a startup is like doing an MBA or like, you know, mm five, 10 years in a, in a massive corporate where you're stuck in one tiny little narrow role, but you do have to um, dive in head first. And so that's what I'd say to young people, you know, dive in, absorb all of that experience. I've seen some people catapult their career and they're now founding businesses. They've already had an exit and then in their late 20s it, it it's it's an amazing journey I love it I'm I, I would never work with any other sector now because because it's so exciting final question looking back on the last 11 years what's the one thing you do differently if you could do it all over again oh gosh uh I think Try not to be as disruptive um, as uh, as I tried to be all at the same time while disrupting the uh, talent position space while uh, trying to set up a business with no funding. You know, perhaps not just be such a rebel, perhaps just conform a little bit more in the early days to make it a slightly easier path but you know have no regrets I have absolutely all the battle scars I've got because of all the mistakes I made and I'm like a wise old owl now it's great <laughs> <laughs> I, I very much I very much doubt that's a description anybody would have of you <laughs> in the nicest way possible um Joe thank you so much um learned so much today and I hope everybody else has and um we'll see everybody this time next week for our next webinar